All right, Psalm 6, we'll begin in the uh, subtitle. It says, To the chief musician on Neganoth upon Sheminoth, a psalm of David. Verse number 1. O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed, but thou, O Lord, how long? Return, O Lord, deliver my soul. O save me for thy mercy's sake. For in death there is no remembrance of thee, and in the grave who shall give thee thanks? I am weary with my groaning. All the night make I my bed to swim. I water my couch with tears. Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. The, the theme of this psalm seems to be a, a little bit different than what we've dealt with in weeks past. And I think you get the sense of that right from the opening. Of course, this one, just like uh, some of the, the uh, past psalms, this is to the chief musician on uh, Neganoth upon Sheminoth. And, uh, of course, uh, this one again, talking about the string instruments. And uh, I, I don't know which of these is true. I don't know that anybody does. But they say the word Sheminoth means the eighth. And maybe it's a lower octave or... Uh, maybe it's a stringed instrument with, with eight strings. I'm not really sure, and I don't know that others are as well. But, but this, this particular psalm, it, it begins a little bit different than what we're used to. It seems like in some of these previous psalms that uh, David has been specifically asking the Lord to help with these enemies that are giving him difficulty. And he, he mentions enemies uh, toward the end of the psalm, but that's not how this one starts. This one starts a little bit different. If you'll note there in verse number 1, he says, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger. In other words, when David is writing this psalm or this song, if you remember, all these are songs that were to be sung in the worship of God, but when he's writing this one, this time it's almost as though David recognizes that he's the, the center of the problem. This time it's not uh, necessarily the enemies, although they're here. Right now, it's, Lord, when you're dealing with me. Uh, the, the fact that he uses the word rebuke in verse number one, the fact that he uses the word uh, chasten in verse number one, uh, indicates to us pretty quickly that David feels like God is dealing with him about his sin. And one of the things that we need to realize about our sin is that our sin often brings, uh, brings with it other consequences or other troubles or other circumstances maybe that we don't uh, think through before we commit the sin. I, I'm reminded of this passage, and I, I'm not going to turn to it this morning, but, but in 2 Samuel chapter, uh, chapter 12, verse number 14, uh, when David committed the sin with Bathsheba, it was said to him, that his sin now gave occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And I doubt very seriously that before you and I commit sin, that we really think through the consequences and the potential consequences of what could happen by our decisions. Uh, people get mad at the Lord and get mad at, at church people, and they decide, well, you know what, forget it, I'm not going to go back to church. Well, what about the missionaries that the church supports? What happens to them? You, you see what I'm saying? Uh, you say, well, I'm just, you know, I'm just, I, 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 I'm not going to do anything for the Lord anymore. I'm not going to do outreach because of this or that or, or what, whatever your thought is. What about the, the consequences that, you know, roll on down the hill because of your decisions? When David decided that he was going to go out to the rooftop and, and look upon a woman and decide to sin for her, I don't think he thought at that moment that the enemies of the Lord are going to mock the Lord and they're going to mock God's people because of my decision. It, listen, if I went out today, and God forbid that this happened, but if I did, if I went out today and I decided to go to a place 
uh, of ill repute and I went out there and did something wicked and that wicked thing got caught in the newspaper or on the news and the news began to report about my wickedness. I don't know that I would have thought through that unsaved and atheistic people in Knoxville, Tennessee are going to find great joy in seeing that a preacher fell. And so David in this, in this psalm I, I think he gets it. He understands I'm the problem. And I think he understands that because I've made some of the decisions that I've made, whatever decisions they are, we're not told in the passage what, uh, what the particular dealings uh, of the Lord are, but whatever it is, he understands God has a responsibility to deal with me. Now there's a lot that can be learned from this psalm and and some beautiful truths that I hope that we can get out, you know, glean out of it in our short time together. But if you'll, if you'll look at verse number one and verse number two, let's focus in on those uh, in, in the beginning here. Verse number one, O Lord, rebuke me not in thine anger, neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am weak. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are vexed. Now, again, I, I, I think it's pretty clear that there's sin involved because David is understanding that the Lord's having to rebuke him and the Lord's having to chasten him. And if you look down to verse number 2 pretty quickly, it says, Have mercy upon me. In other words, Lord, I need you to withhold from me some bad things that I deserve right now. I don't know that I can handle the full extent of the law when it comes to what I've done and what you should do to me in response to that. That's been man's cry since, uh, since as far back as we can go. Do you remember that, that Cain said, my, my punishment is greater than I can bear? I mean, man, since he's been sinning, has been looking at God and saying, God, would you please take it easy on me when you deal with me about my sin? Now that's, I don't know, I feel pretty pathetic about that. I don't know how you feel. But what a shame it is that man decides to sin, and then he looks at a holy God and says, God, would you please not hammer, uh, hammer me or deal with me like you would deal with me. I'm asking that you give me some mercy. Well, why don't we just, uh, instead of sinning and then asking God for mercy, why don't we ask God for mercy not to sin and grace not to sin and help not to sin and the, the sufficiency of God not to sin? Why is it that man always does what he wants to do and then says, make the consequences light? I mean, if, if, this, if we were talking about a court of law in the United States of America and we talked about, uh, you know, such and such man created a, a, or committed a horrible crime and he went out and murdered 10 people and he goes before the judge and he says, Judge, I'm asking for mercy. Every one of us would look and say, that man deserves no mercy. And yet that's exactly how we do things with the Lord. Come on now, you, you, know, this, you know this statement. It's easier to ask for mercy forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. That's wicked. I would rather do what I want to do and then when it comes judgment time, look at the judge and say, by the way, would you take it easy on me? Oh, that God, and I know this grace is available to us. I just wish we would access it. Oh, that God will get a hold of our hearts before we choose to sin against Him and there would never be a need to ask for that help in judgment. Now we find here David, he says, rebuke me not. Now listen, he's not asking God not to rebuke him. He's not asking God not to chasten him. He's asking for God's motive or God's driving force behind the judgment. Watch this. Oh Lord... Rebuke me not in thine, what? Anger. Neither chasten me in thy hot displeasure. See, David understands it is not right of him to go to the Lord after he sinned and say, please don't rebuke me, please don't chasten me. The point of the passage is, he's saying, Lord, I know you're going to rebuke me, I know you're going to chasten me, but when you do rebuke me, please, please, Lord, please make sure that it's not in your anger. 
Please, Lord, make, make sure that when you, uh, when you deal with me and you, you punish me and you convict me or whatever you have to do, would you do it as a father does to his son? Would you withhold the anger? Would you withhold the hot displeasure? I'm reminded of the passage over there in Hebrews that we often look at where it talks about chastening and, and dealing with things. And he said that, that, that our fathers, our earthly fathers, often chasten, oftentimes chastened us according to the flesh. In other words, they would do things because uh, maybe Maybe something annoyed them or something bothered them and maybe it wasn't necessarily right or wrong and maybe the, the, the driving force of their chastening wasn't quite right and that man has that problem but David's asking God when you deal with me and I know you have to but would you please Lord make sure that it's not in your anger would you please make sure it's not in your hot displeasure you say why does that matter because if God came down with the full extent of the law and the full extent of judgment and he did so in anger David would not live to write another psalm. You say, well, how do you know that's what's going on? I, I think I know that because if you look at verse down here, we're not necessarily jumping down to this right now, but if you'll look uh, in verse number, four, uh, verse number five, I think this is what he's saying. God, if you do this thing the way you could do it, I won't survive to tell about it. Look at verse number five, for in death there is no remembrance of thee. I think what David's saying here is, Lord, if you give me what I deserve, and you judge me in anger and displeasure, I won't live to tell about it. Now, other than the young people in this room, if you're an adult, and you look at a passage like Psalm 6, and you don't see yourself, and you don't see that there have been times in your life, at least times, that you really deserved, before salvation, after salvation, that you deserve for God to, to judge you and really just to, to snuff out your life. Just to pluck you out of here and say, you know what, I'm done with you. You've given the enemies of the Lord cause to blaspheme. I, I've had enough of this. If you can't look at your life and see that there have been times where God would have been righteous to do that, then you don't, you don't understand who you are. Every day that you wake up and you look in the mirror or whatever you do, you should realize that it is only of the grace of God that you're breathing and that you're able to live another day and do something for Him. He did not keep you around because you're so great. He did not keep you around because you've always been successful in His work. He didn't keep you around because you always do right. He has kept you around in spite of who you are. Now this thing's weighing on David and, and there's layers of, of, of consequence. He says in verse number 2, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, uh, for I am weak. In other words, Lord, I don't know that I could... My, my own sin, my sin has brought, brought consequences. Uh, the, the situation I'm dealing with with the enemies of the Lord, that's brought consequences. Lord, I'm weak. I'm weak. And look what he says here in verse, verse number 2. He says, O Lord, heal me. For my bones are vexed. Man, I, 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 when I read the Bible, I think that people must have had a much deeper walk with God than what we have today. I, I just, I really believe that. I know people were people just like we're people. But David has sinned, and he's dealing with the consequences of that sin, and the frustration, maybe the conviction, I don't know what word to use right here because I, don't, I, I just don't have it. But whatever uh, the consequences of his sin, he's feeling vexed in his bones. I mean, sin is affecting him so deeply, it's not just some flippant thing that, oh yeah, you know, I sinned and it's no big deal and just sweep it under the rug. This thing is impacting him so deeply that he's feeling pain in his bones. Now, now listen, you, you know this to be true, that uh, if, you, if you were to get, uh, I, I don't know, some sort of depression or something like that, you're dealing with depression, there are times where it affects you so, so much that you can start feeling pain in your bones, and I mean, you can start feeling pain in your body. And I don't know, I mean, I, I'm sure there are others that could explain this. I don't know scientifically how this works, but it's, it's not that you... You did something in your bones. It's the, 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 the feelings, the emotions of life are impacting you physically. Now we feel that 
in a worldly sense. I want to ask you this. I, maybe, I'm not asking for a show of hands. Please don't, in fact. But I wonder when the last time we felt so deeply bothered about our sins that we felt it in our bones. I, do you understand what I'm saying? Something's shifted over time. And I don't think it's God. I mean, let's say you, uh, some man looks upon a woman to lust after her. I, I don't know. Do you feel it in your bones? you feel the conviction and the guilt and the, the frustration with yourself? Do you feel that? I mean, uh, somebody tells, you know, goes about telling lies. Do you, do you feel that in your bones? I mean, you're, you're so vexed inside that you did such a thing that you're feeling the consequences in your bones? Something's, something's changed. I mean, David's feeling this thing so deeply, it's almost as though he's looking at the Lord and saying, Lord, I already get the point. You don't even have to do anything else. I already know I'm wrong. I'm guilty. I'm vile. I'm horrific. I, I, I'm repenting in dust and ashes, Lord. I'm nothing. I already get it. You don't have to do anything else. And yet Christians today, we, we sin and we sin and we sin and we sin and even God can't get our attention. I'm convinced some people take Christianity so light, it's just, I, I, don't, I don't even know what to say about it. I mean, we, we don't read our Bibles, we don't pray, we don't, we don't witness, we don't have any fellowship with the Lord, we... We make light of His Word. I mean, we mock, you know, preachers get up and preach the Bible and we, we mock that and think that's, you know, oh, that's funny, you know, that's humorous. and Something's wrong. I mean, God's still God. God's still on the throne. God's still holy. God's still righteous. God has not changed His ways. I mean, God is still who God is. So it's not God. We can't, we can't point the finger toward heaven and say that God has eased up, or, or people say, well, we're in the age of grace. There was grace in the Old Testament. And quit this business of suggesting that God was really mean and hard in the Old Testament, and now He doesn't care about anything in the New Testament. Have you ever read your New Testament? I, I told him in class the other night, in the New Testament, Jesus said, oftentimes He said, you've heard that it was said in old time, but I say unto you, and what everything He followed with was rougher than the Old Testament. The Old Testament law was easy in comparison with what Jesus said. He said, you've heard that it's been said in old time, a man should not commit adultery with a woman. But he said, I say unto you, a man's not even to look upon a woman to lust after her. And if he does, he's already committed adultery with her in his heart. Man, that's more strict. Because God is still as disgusted with sin today as he ever has been. The problem is, we aren't. Now he says again in verse number 3, My soul, he, he's, his bones are vexed. My soul is also sore vexed. And I, I, I think he's talking about it, his entire being because we see something down below that seems to insinuate that's the truth. But he says, But thou, oh Lord, how long? <laughs> it, it's, you get the idea that David is feeling so much conviction. And, and I think this is what's happened, okay? L look, look at the first word in verse number 4. What's the first word? Tell me what it is. Return. David's sin has broken fellowship with God, and he feels as though God has vacated David. David feels so bothered by the silence. The fellowship that he and God could be having right now, they're not having it, and that's eating at him. So much so that he doesn't need God to do anything else. God doesn't have to show up and discipline him. God doesn't have to do anything crazy. I'm already feeling the effects. This is enough. Uh, please just return. How long is this going to go on? How long do I have to uh, go days or weeks or months or years without good fellowship with God? God, how long? Please return. Uh, rekindle the fellowship. Again, what a great indication that things have changed. We can go days, weeks. You know, you know something? God doesn't speak audibly today. God, people say, you know, guys will say, well, God spoke to me. Well, I hope what you mean is 
God dealt with my heart. God, uh, you know, worked in my heart through the Bible or God worked in my heart while I was praying. If you're hearing audible voices, it's somebody else. It's not God that you're hearing. But God does speak to our hearts in a still small voice and inside your heart you can feel the conviction or you can feel the encouragement or you can, you can get a sense surely that God is dealing with you and that you're in fellowship with Him. The problem is how many days and weeks and months and years can you go with nothing going on on the inside before you get bothered? Do you understand that you and I allow the fellowship between us and the Lord to go uh, through silence and through brokenness for, for weeks and we never get bothered about it. We never pursue the Lord and say, Lord, I, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know what's broken this fellowship, but we, we got to get this fixed. I, I, can't, I can't handle you and I not having time together and I can't handle uh, there being a lack of conviction in my heart. I can't handle the lack of encouragement that I'm getting inside. And so, Lord, I need you. How long? How long, Lord? Return. I need the fellowship restored. Now, let's read on down. He said, deliver my soul. Save me for thy mercy's sake. Again, I think he's talking about him, his, his life. And I, and I believe that because in verse number 5 he said, for in death there is no remembrance of thee, and in the grave who shall give thee thanks? In other words, Lord, if you do what you, if you let me keep going this way, or if you decide you've had enough of me, and you snuff me out, you kill me, Lord, what am I, how can I, how can I give you thanks then? Now look with me, if you will, to verse number 6. He said, I'm weary with my groaning. Groaning is not even necessarily words, it's not, I mean, David's not even necessarily saying things in that part of the verse. He says, all the night make I my bed to swim. In other words, I'm crying so, that's what he's saying, I'm crying so much I could swim in my tears. I water my couch with my tears. I don't know, I'm just going to tell you, it's, and maybe this morning, I don't know, maybe I'm confessing faults to you. I don't, I don't have any idea, okay, I don't know if I am, I'm you know, I'm sorry to do that, but I'm not much of a crier. It, it takes certain specific situation scenarios to bring me to tears. It's, it, I can't work up tears. So I'm convinced there's some people can work them up. I mean, some of you in here, especially some of you uh, young, you know, young girls, you could probably uh, get yourself in an emotional frenzy and start crying if you wanted to just to get, you know, dad's attention or mom's attention or somebody else's. I can't work up tears. It's not in me. There may be others in here that say the same thing. I just can't. Something's got to happen, oftentimes unexpected, to catch me off guard, and I can start crying. David is weeping so much because he has lost the, the sweetness of God's fellowship. Now, I don't think he literally means that he is swimming in his tears. I think the point is, I am weeping uncontrollably. I can't stop crying. You say, well, he just needs to man up. Well, no, I think he is manning up. I think that's what he's doing in Psalm 6. He's manning up and owning that he has sinned against God, and it's bothering him so much that he's, when he should be maybe sleeping, he's instead crying. When he maybe should be doing other things, he can't do those things. He can't perform his duties because he's so tore up about the lack of fellowship with God. Now this thing's wore him out. He's weary because of his groaning. He's crying uncontrollably. If you've ever cried an extended time, you've been to a funeral or you've, the, the loss of a loved one, you've cried so much you're just tired. You can't handle it. Your eyes are hurting. He says in verse 7, Mine eye is consumed because of grief. It waxeth old because of all mine enemies. Now we're going to get a glimpse into something else that's going on. What do you mean it waxeth old because of all mine enemies? Now apparently people are coming out of the woodworks. It's interesting in verse 8. He said, Depart from me all ye workers of iniquity. That's not the Lord speaking. That's David speaking. 
You say, well, Jesus says that in the New Testament. I understand, but that's David speaking in verse number 8. David is saying to his enemies, depart, get away from me, leave me alone, let me be. In verse number 7, he says, my enemies are making my, my eyes wax old. Verse number 8, he says, I need you all to depart from me. Why? Why is he telling them now to depart? He says in verse 8, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. In other words, God heard me when I cried out to him. You say, what in the world's going on? I don't know. It could be that when David sinned against the Lord, that people came out and started mocking him for it. You say, well, that would never happen. You're crazy. It amazes me that unsaved people would mock saved people for sinning. But they do it all the time. As a matter of fact, they want you to sin so that they can make fun of you for sinning. That's where David is. Whatever he's done, now all of a sudden, all these people around him are moving in. I remember one time I told somebody, I said, look, I don't know, this was in ministry, I said, I don't know whether I made the right decision or not. That was the worst thing I could have said. From that moment on, that person said, well, see, you don't even know if you made the right decision. All I'm trying to do is tell you I'm a human being and I make mistakes. Don't you all? Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever sinned and done something that you weren't supposed to do? Have you ever done something and later you thought about it and thought, well, maybe I should have done it this way instead of that way? Come on, that's humanity. And yet people are always watching and hoping that you'll fall. And David says, I need the enemies to depart. Leave me alone. God heard me. God's going to restore fellowship. Move on with your life. What a blessing. What a blessing. And he says here in verse number 8, Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity, for the Lord hath heard the voice of my weeping. That's interesting. It's not even necessarily words. It's weeping. But then look what he says. The Lord hath heard my supplication. The Lord will receive my prayer. Now look how this thing's going to turn. Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. All those people sitting around mocking David for his sin, whatever it is, and mocking that God's dealing with him about his sin, he said, you need to understand something. The tables are turning. It's no longer David that needs to be ashamed. David's getting things right with God. Now, all of you that are sitting around mocking me because of the dealings of God with my heart, you need to understand now, it's you that needs to be ashamed. It's you that's going to be sore vexed. Listen, this world is hoping for opportunities to ridicule you about your faith. But you need to understand while they're ridiculing, there is coming a day when the tables are going to turn and God's going to deal with the wicked. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. It may not be next week. But I assure you, the day's coming. Everybody that's mocked you for, for, for something that you've done and God's dealings with you, they need to understand the day is coming when God's attention will be squarely focused on them. If they're unsaved, let me tell you how that goes. At the great wine throne judgment, the Bible says the heaven and earth flee away. There's nowhere to stand. There's nowhere to hide. There, there's nothing to hide behind. It'll be God and a man. And God will look at that man, and God will say to that man, depart from me. God will look at that man, and he'll say to that man, you're unsaved. He said, I don't know you. And he'll cast him into, into the lake of fire for all eternity. What a horrific thing. David says here in verse number 10, Let all mine enemies be ashamed and sore vexed. Let them return and be ashamed suddenly. Is there, I guess I'm going to close it this way. Is there something going on in your life? Some area where you've sinned against the Lord. Some area where the fellowship between you and the Lord has been broken. Something's not quite right. If there is, how long are you going to let that go on before you do something about it? It's not God that needs to come back and do something about the fellowship. God's, God didn't change. God didn't move. You moved. Whatever it is that you did that drove the fellowship away, how long are you going to let that go on before it bothers you so much that you've got to get it fixed? How long are you going to let it go on? 
just because you show up at church, just because you go through the motions of Christianity, it doesn't mean your fellowship with God's right. People can be in church every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday night, and every special meeting, and every outreach, and still something be wrong on the inside. And here's the thing. I can't tell whether your fellowship with God is broken, but you know. You know if there's bitterness in your heart. You know if there's anger. You know, you know what's going on in there. Don't look at me and expect me to come to you and tell you it's time to get it fixed. I can't tell until you've gone so far that it's big trouble. But surely you know. And I want to ask every pot, young person, old person alike, okay, this is it, I'm, I'm finishing up. But I'm asking you as individuals, how is your fellowship with God? Is it broken or is it strong? If it's broken, why and how long are you going to let it go on? Isn't it time to get it fixed? If it is, who's going to fix it? 